Welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna be talking about this old shotgun. So this is a WW Greener from sometime before 1914 because of the address that's printed on the rib of the shotgun. Um, it is a side lock hammer gun in 12 gauge. So you've probably seen videos of me doing clean and service before. Now we're actually getting into some actual gunsmithing. So the issue that this gun has, apart from, you know, we have cracked stock. So uh, the head of the stock here is cracked that needs repairing. Um, someone tried to do a repair on the fore end here that's usually made of horn or ebony. And uh, they've just glued in a piece of pine that's not even fitted correctly. Um, and stained it orange for whatever reason. So that needs to get fixed. But the biggest issue that this gun has is its firing pins. So once I pulled it apart and did its service, I noticed that this firing pin was sticking a bit and there was also a bit of a disparity between our nipples. This nipple here was in the left fence. This nipple here was in the right fence. Uh, fences, detonators, breech face, whatever you want to call it. There's a many different names for these components. Um, I use them all interchangeably because there's a million different ways of saying it. So if I don't call something the way that you know it as, then I apologize. Um, there's just too many bloody names when it comes to shotguns. We also have different firing pins. So we'll, we'll do close-ups of this in a second, but we have mismatched firing pins, we have mismatched nipples, um, and yeah, it, it seems like someone's done some work to this gun. Now, Traditionally, this green nut would have been color case hard, and there is evidence of color case hardening in some places, but it also looks like this action has been blued at some point. So you kind of see it's worn there, um, but the rest of it looks quite blued. Now that's a little bit odd because from my knowledge of greeners, particularly ones that are this old, they wouldn't have been blued. So I think this has been serviced by someone before. Um, but yeah, that's not really the remit of this video. We're talking about a nipple. So let's get a close up and we will get into it. All right, so here we are at the elephant in the room. So everything on the left here is correct to this gun. We have the correct nipple, we have the correct firing pin or striker. And on the right, we have a different firing pin or striker and a different nipple. So let's have a quick chat about these. These firing pins are different measurements. This firing pin will not fit in the original nipple. This firing pin will not fit in this nipple. Now that's not completely uncommon for an old shotgun because a lot of stuff is fitted by hand. So left with left, right with right. Um, so potentially these firing pins are both um, originals. However, we have different collars on them. So this one here is flat based on the bottom and tapered forward. This one here is flat based uh, and actually domed. So it's slightly different form factor to it. Um, they are almost the same length, but not quite. Um, so it leads me to believe that potentially when this nipple was changed, which we're gonna talk about in a second, this firing pin may have been changed. It will probably still work, but it's just something we need to bear in mind when we're fitting this up together. Now you can see that the form factor on these two is quite different. This one looks really small. This one has a lot bigger of a head on it. Now. What I believe they have done is this has been made from an old grease nipple. And I'll tell you why I came to that conclusion now. This here is 32 TPI. This here is also 32 TPI. However, this and this are actually two different sizes. So if I was to uh, mark these, 0.235, Point two fifty two. What does it tell us? A two thirty five by thirty two TPI and a two fifty by thirty two TPI. This is a quarter thirty two grease nipple. You can kind of tell at the end here that that part has been cut um, and it has not been cut straight. And that would be the bottom of the grease nipple, and it would come up and barely out at the top here. Um, you can also tell because if you look at the top there, now these also are different size hexes. So let's zoom out a little bit and let's talk about the action and what they've done uh, here. This one fits into here. If we try to put this original nipple into the right side where this grease nipple came out of, you'll see that it slips straight in. 
sorry, the threads are buggered up. And now that is because they have torqued in a, um, essentially a fastener that is too big for the threaded hole. So being that this is, what do we say, it was 235 versus 250. So being that this is 15 thou bigger, yeah, the, the thread picture is the same, but the thread depth is not the same. So to fix this, we're going to have to, now these are a little bit buggered up in here and it's kind of hard to get even this one back in. So I'm gonna to have to run a quarter 32 tap down there just to clean those threads up slightly uh, and just make sure that that is all the correct depth and everything. And then I'm gonna to have to remake this nipple. Now the reason why I'm not just gonna reuse that one because it's not from this gun, but two, if we were to put that in there and that in there, Let's zoom back in again. You can see how much uh, of the rear of the firing pin is protruding from each one. Now, the drama with that is the hammer is going to come all the way down and push that like that. And we're gonna have excessive firing pin protrusion, which is obviously not good for your primers. Um, you do not wanna wreck your primers. So we kind of want it to fit like that. Now the other thing that this gun doesn't have, which I kind of expected it would have, is um, springs to return these firing pins back out after they've struck. Um, generally that's the thing you'll see on hammer guns. Now potentially because of how old the shotgun is, maybe back then Grainer wasn't putting in uh, springs, um, but that's probably something we're gonna be looking at as well, is potentially um, putting return springs in here just as an added safety feature because you kind of don't want your firing pins flopping around and being able to uh, touch the primers. So that's been a really long-winded preamble, but I feel like uh, you need to have the background information before we can go on to doing what we're gonna do. We're gonna make this striker nipple to match this striker nipple. However, it's going to have the quarter 32 thread on it so it fits what they have buggered up in the back of our fence. Now, I thought it would be appropriate to actually point out what we're making. Now, this is a very, very crude drawing. Uh, and before we go into it, yes, I understand that 150 and 170 together do not equal 370. It's not counting for the width of that. I'm not gonna go into the full weeds of this. This is just a rough sketch to keep me, something I can just glance at instead of having to remeasure the nipple every single time. So, 250 wide by 32 TPI. That section there is gonna be 170 long. We then have this collar, which is, you know, 30 thou or something. The head of the nipple is going to be um, 150. It's 320 wide from the end of this. Uh, we're gonna call that the collar, uh, which is the widest part, is 320. Um, the width of this is, that's a measurement I didn't put down actually, the width of that. It's probably going to be 300 and something. 269, nice. So let's put that down. And then our flats for our uh, hex pattern are going to be 120 deep. I'm not going to figure out exactly how wide these flats are going to be yet, because I'll do that once I hit the mill. But for now, just some, when I'm on the lathe, I've got something I can glance at. So uh, yeah, there you go. Let's lathe this up. All right, so here we are at the lathe. Now, hopefully that stays in focus. I can't really see what the camera's doing, um, but we'll roll from there. So it's just a piece of scrap, hot rolled um, steel. I'm just gonna adjust my light so I don't hit the camera. Um, so we're just gonna take this down to our major dimension, which is 320 for a length of 370 or probably go to 400. Um, and we can just start going from there. That is much too slow. Let's speed that up a bit. Change my belts over. I'm still using carbide. I need that to be running a hell of a lot faster than it was. There we go, that's better. So that's uh, 1200 up here. Let's quickly check where we're at. 
345. So I'm going to come in 15th hour. Let's just go 10th hour for now. So make up on it. Now this dimension's not critical, so it doesn't really matter if we're a little bit off. 335. Alright, so should be our dimension there, or close enough to it. As I said, it's not critical. That's 321. 321, 322. We're trying to spring pass over that. So what we're going to turn here is this front part where the thread is. All right, so we're not going to worry about anything above the collar. We're just going to cut this part here. So we need to take this down to a major size of 250 for a length of 170. Pretty close. Now I'm going to flick over to my mic. Let me get that accurate. You can read that. That is 250 on the dot. So I'm just going to do a bit of lead in on that for the thread. Alright, so I was just taking those sharp edges off. So now we just set it for threading and we are going to thread that end to 32 TPI. Now this is running at uh, 130 RPM. Uh, I've got a carbide cutter in there. It's a little bit slow for carbide. Um, but I can't be asked getting my high speed steel one sorted. We'll see how this goes. Obviously, if we wreck that, we can just make it again. It's not really a big deal. All right, so this should just be a scratch pass. And obviously, it's starting a fair way back. I like to start my threads a fair way back so I've got time to you know, glance over everything and double check everything before it starts, get ready for it so I can turn it off. And bang, there we are. And now we can double check that that thread pitch is correct with our thread pitch gauge. Yep, we are turning a 32 TPI thread. Now one thing I do want to do is I want to clean up this gutter just in the back here. Using your finger as a pointer, that's a no-no. So I want to clean up this gutter in here just so that we know that this is not going to uh, impede us going into the action. Right, that all looks pretty good to me. And I'm sorry that the camera will not stay in focus. It's a very small part and it's hard to do. All right, so while we're in this setup, we're gonna drill our firing pin hole because um, I wanna make sure the firing pin hole is concentric to the thread. So I'll just reset up the lathe for a different gear setting. Um, and then I'll come back and you'll, next thing you'll see is me drawing that hole. All right, so what we have here is a 1 8 drill. Um, so that mic'd up to be like 0.124. The firing pin we're trying to drill a hole for is uh, 125. Now, my thought process is if I use a 124 and it drills slightly oversized, it will fit the firing pin perfectly. If it still doesn't fit, the next drill size up I have is a 3.5 millimeter, which works out to be like a 138 thou. So it'll give us you know, a few thou slop, but it shouldn't be too much of a drama. So we're just gonna drill with this one, we'll measure and fit, and if we need to step up, we can step up. All 
All right, so there you have it. That's uh, drilling a hole. That's not really that exciting, is it? All right, so we've drilled a hole that was with a 1 8 bit. Now I did say it was a 124 drill, and this is supposed to be 125, or what I measured at 125. It did, dr did drill slightly oversized, which means that fits in there nicely now. I don't have my collet chuck for this fully functioning yet. Um, I do have a, a MT5 uh, collet chuck, but I haven't got the draw bar yet. I've got some threaded rod coming in the mail to make that draw bar. So normally what I would do is I would cut that off, flip it around, use a collet to hold the threaded end, um, and then you know do the other side. But because I don't have that functioning, obviously I can't hold the collet chuck into the spindle if I don't have the draw bar. So what I'm gonna do is I have a left hand turning tool. So I'm gonna cut a little groove with a parting blade, use a left hand turning tool to turn from left to right back the other direction and make our major diameter on our, our um, hex end uh, and then cut in that little shoulder. So let's uh, crack into that. All right, welcome to my janky setup. So what I had to do, um, so I've got a center here because of how far it's sticking out. That center also helped me keep uh, this somewhat concentric to the middle board. Now obviously this is not super important. It's a bloody firing pin nipple. It's not, you know, I'm not chambering a rifle here. So it's not super critical that it's completely concentric. So I've got it sticking out. I had to turn this section here down so I could get my turning tool in. Now this turning tool does have a lot of stick out, but you know, it's mild steel, it's a very small part, and we're not gonna be taking very deep cuts. So it will be fine. So hopefully you can kind of see what we're trying to get to. It's kind of hard for me to hold. So we have our threaded end, we have our little collar. Now, this is going to get chopped off with a hacksaw. It's going to get thrown into a collet block and then we're going to go and mill the rest of it. Now, obviously, if I had that collet chuck in the lathe and when I flipped this around and we would have done this instead of doing it in reverse, um, the end would get faced. But uh, since we don't, um, that is going to get brought to size in the mill. We'll just side mill it down because um, it'll be pretty much same same and you won't be able to tell the difference. So let's get this cut, cut off with a hacksaw and we'll meet over at the mill. All right, so here we are on the mill. Now, what I've done is I've put a five flute end mill in there. We have uh, the threaded end held in this collet. Uh, now it's not cranked down stupidly tight because you want to wreck those shreds, um, but it should be fine. I've already found the edge of our part. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna side mill that to length first. Um, and then once we've side milled it to length, that's when we are going to uh, start rotating our collet block uh, and cutting our hex head on the top. So we need the end of this to be 170 there long. So I will do, take a clean up pass first, take our first measurement, and then we know how far we need to come in on our DRO. 260, so we need to come in 90 there. All right, so we'll do probably 30 there passes, I guess. All right, now we're at length. So now we can go along with cutting our hex. So to figure that out, we know what our major diameter is, and then we're gonna measure two of the flats on this to figure out how far in we're gonna come now. I'll show you this when we do a close up later, but um, this was filed in by hand, so it's not exactly flat. 230, 232, 234, 231. So at 232-ish. So if we went from, what do we actually say that, 269. So if we go, let's call it 268. 268 minus 
2 equals 36 divided by 2 equals 18. So we need to come down 18 thou from the top. Oh, we also, uh, so we zero, zero out our z, we need to come in the distance of our flats, which was from our thing 120 thou. So let's come in. Sorry, you can't see what I'm doing because I'm looking at my DRO, but just trust me, it's, we've come in 120 thou. If we figure out where our top is, which is there, lock that down, come off the part. Now, yeah, zero out our z, and we need to come down 18 thou. That looks about right. Now, yeah, because we're in a collar block and we're zeroed out and everything, all we need to do is rotate. Oh, there you have it. That's a hex cat. Super simple stuff. All right, let's go back to the bench. Um, next time you see me, that's going to be completely deburred, polished up, and we're going to be next to our other nipple, and we can compare the two. Right, so here we are installed into the gun. So original greener and the one I've just made. Now, obviously, it's a bit silver. You can tell that will get um, blued and it will be blended in to look like it's been there for a hundred years. Now I'm not trying to make it look like a brand new part. I want it to look like it's the original part. It's important when you're working on the older stuff that you want it to look like you haven't been there. That's when, when I've done my job correctly, you can't tell that I have been there and done the work. Now, if you're working on something modern or you're doing a custom build or whatever, obviously you do want to know that, you know, the gunsmith has been there, but for this sort of stuff, you don't. As I said before, this one had its hex cut in by hand. Now you can kind of tell that it's wonky as all get out, especially that end there, because obviously it fold by hand. Now, with modern machinery, we've made that hex look uh, a hell of a lot better, but what I did was I kind of got on these edges with a needle file and kind of made it look not perfect. Now, that might sound like a cop out of like, no, you just got real shit skills, um, but that's what I've kind of done because the owner of this gun does not want this to look like a new piece. You can see because we end up having to move that setup in the lathe here, that hole is not exactly concentric, but that's not going to impede the operation of this gun. And if anything, it kind of makes it look more like it's a hand filed component and not a refab. So there you have it. That's creating a firing pin nipple. Um, it's not exactly exciting work. It's just, you know, that small stuff you've got to kind of do to get this gun back into action because there's no point having old guns if you can't use them. So you need to do the maintenance. Um, if you need to fix a gun, obviously, yeah, you can use an old grease nipple. Um, that kind of worked-ish. You're probably better off doing it correctly in the first instance so you don't have to go through the shit fight down the track and or, you know, when you pass your guns down to your kids and then their kids, they don't have to then contact a gunsmith to get the parts replaced. So do the maintenance, get your parts sorted. If you've got any hints or tips or anything you want to drop in the comments, feel free, drop them below. Um, I'll catch you next video and hooroo.